here's my pitch for Dead Zone. Dead Zone's easily one of the most fun and awesome tabletop games ever created. The end. Thank you for attending my TED Talk. I'll be signing books in the lobby. No, th- no thank you. No, th- thank you so much, guys. Okay, okay thanks. All right, see you. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and keep all names, guys. All right, see you guys. Thank you. Bye. Okay, while all of that's true, some people might not know that yet, or really want to know that, so enter this video. This is going to be a crash course in all things Dead Zone, why it's so awesome, and how to play this epic game. This is the best possible time to get into Dead Zone, because we're at the start of a new edition, so this video is designed for anyone who's never even heard of Dead Zone. By the way, if you're one of those people, hey, what's up? How you doing today? You look great. You know you should grab a beverage, sit back, relax, and get ready to hear about the greatest skirmish game of all time. And if you're a grizzled hardcore, been there since first edition when people had different missions and revs suck super bad kind of player, then this video ought to be fun for you too, because we're at the start of a new edition, guys. This is going to be lots of changes to the lore, the rules, the aesthetics, and that tends to either scare people or... It gets the people going! By the way, my name is Tyler, and I'm going to be your guide into the wonderful world of... So let's start super basic. What is Dead Zone? Dead Zone is a futuristic sci-fi miniature war game that takes place in what's known as the Warpath universe, a universe that's got tons of creative and cool aliens, worlds, weapons, and truly limitless potential. So let's start there. Let's start with the brief rundown of the lore before we get into the beautiful streamlined gameplay that'll keep you coming back. If you guys want to skip ahead to the gameplay mechanics, you can go to this timestamp, but the lore is really cool, and I promise I'll keep it brief. At the core of the lore, hey, that rhymed, is the GCPS, the Galactic Co-Prosperity Sphere. That acronym sounded super hyper-corporate, it's because it is. Humans are a bunch of greedy corporations run by a secret group of dudes or corporate entities or whatever they are, called the Council of Seven, and basically humans have been expanding rapidly and pissing off a lot of stuff along the way. Humans started where we are today, but just kind of never stopped expanding, creating different spheres of influence. The first sphere, is the oldest and the territory with the fanciest societies and the highest tech, and basically the fifth sphere being the very edge of the galaxy, hardly explored, and constantly learning about all the crazy new things that are out there in space. As humanity expanded outwards, they learned about a whole lot of factions, some happy to be absorbed with the GCPS, the nice corporate lifestyle, and some who were less enthused. More on that in just a second. There's a lot of history to unpack here, and I don't have time to do it all in this video, but I'm going to give you a quick rundown. Basically, humans liked hiring orcs called marauders for protection, until some of those same marauders got sick of the humans' crap, and had a massive, and a little bit too successful, rebellion, to which the GCPS was like, uh, maybe we shouldn't outsource our defense, uh, so basically they created the enforcers and buckled down on corporate armies so that they couldn't get bodied again. But like humans do, that gets a little out of hand, and the humans like to get a little overboard, and so they try to keep the galaxy a little too safe and a little too protected. Hence, dead zones. Dead zones are what happen when planets are locked down for one reason or another. And when I say locked down, I don't mean like sitting at home watching Tiger King and hoarding bottles of hand sanitizer kind of locked down. This could be because of a mutant plague outbreak, a planet-wide rat infestation, yada yada yada, the list goes on and on. But basically, when a threat is bad enough, the GCPS lock down a planet and erase it from the map. Whether it's a brand new place with outposts and mining groups, or it's chuck full of citizens and commerce that have been there for decades. But when you wipe planets off the map, that means that it basically becomes the wild wild west, baby. And it's come one, come all to the planet of untapped potential. This is how you end up with lots of mercenaries, people fighting just to make a quick dollar. You've got people fighting for their homeland. You've got crazy infecting monsters all in the same places. And so this is what Dead Zone is all about. So now let's jump into the super quick rundown of all the factions, and hopefully I'll do full videos on these guys later with tactical breakdowns and all that, but we get there when we get there. Gonna be down the road, so let's hop into factions. Choose your character. Ready? Go! Let's start with the GCPS. So this is kind of a catch-all term for all the private militaries that are found across all the GCPS's spheres of influences. 
I realize I just said the Galactic Co. Prosperity Spheres Sphere, kind of like saying ATM machine, but oh well, I'm keeping it in. Anyways, these are going to be your basic human dudes that are armed with laser guns and facing insurmountable odds. Think like the Marines in Halo or the Starship Troopers, minus all the bugs, at least for now. Armed with lots of bodies, heavy weapons, and a classic military feel, these guys are ready to shoot stuff all across the galaxy. So if you're a big fan of being the status quo with lots of guns and corporate greed in your heart, this is the faction for you. Use your character. Ready? Go! Enforcers are the elite superhuman secret space police that are the best the Council of Seven can offer. They run faster, jump higher than any normal human and have super cool looking armor that takes just a little bit of inspiration from your boy Tony Stark. Enforcers are the premier symbol of authority and are often the ones that lock down planets and treat everything as hostile, which usually means if you see them coming, you're gonna have a bad time. There are also lightly armored pathfinders that scout ahead and analyze threats before the big chonky boys get involved, if that's more your thing. Or you can do kind of a mix of both. If being a hyper-efficient weapon of war super soldier with lots of equipment and tons of combat options is your thing, this is the faction for you. Use your character! I briefly touched on the orcs earlier in the lore segment, but basically there's no way, easy way to put this. They're not your classic fantasy style orcs, or grimdark orcs for that matter. They're kind of their own thing. Really, the only thing that they have in common is that they're green and they like fighting stuff, but that's mostly because they're really good at it. If you're good at something, never do it for free. So good, in fact, that they almost won a rebellion against the GCPS, like I said before, the Mandrake Rebellion. Marauders are tactical, cunning, and down to get dirty to get into the thick of things. Their base troops are called commandos, so that should tell you quite a bit about them. In addition to orcs, they are often seen fighting along hulks, which are like big troll type dudes, and goblins as well. Also, quick fun fact, marauders are immune to the plague for unknown reasons, but that makes them perfect mercs for dead zones because they can get called in and aren't at a risk for adding to the problem, like most of the things are. If you like military guys but wish they were all green, with big jaw lines and really big green muscles, then this is the faction for you. Use your character. And then there's Hysterians, the space elf dudes that are basically looking at the GCPS and saying, You ain't got the answer, Sway! Kanye. I've been doing this more than you! Hysterians have been around for a long time. Like, a really long time. So, they look at humanity's spread and they're kind of like, Yeah, you kids don't know what you're doing. They believe in keeping to themselves and not fighting a whole lot, but more importantly than that, they believe in balance of the universe. And with the whole place going crazy, there's some balancing that needs to be done. Asterians use lots of droids and robots to do their fighting, mostly because they don't want to die. So they pilot cool bots like the Cyphers and the Marionettes, and occasionally super cool stuff like the Spectras, to even the balance of the universe, usually by shooting it to death. There are also some that are up close and personal, like the Kalishi, and a miniature sub-faction called the Matsudan, which are basically Japanese-inspired sumo lizards that are similar thinking to the Asterians, so they, they partner up a lot. If you like fragile but elite sharpshooting robots with super sleek space tech and a knack for yin and yang, this is the faction for you. Use your character. Grumpy, stubborn, short, and technologically superior, Forge Fathers are the premier artisans, and you guessed it, Forgers in the galaxy. While lots of Forge Fathers do trade and make deals with the GTPS, some don't always go super smoothly, so they have a kick-ass military with lots of options. No, seriously, they have so many options. Well, almost like they're somebody's favorite faction. But anyways, Forge Fathers pride themselves on having high armor penetrating rounds, and lots of thick armor to be the walking tanks and slow but efficient hammer in the galaxy. Plus, they harvest stars. Yeah, like, full-on stars. They harvest those. Cousin business is a boom. So if you like dwarves with powerful weapons, hammers, heavy armor, and a huge selection of models, this is the faction for you. Use your character! Ready? Go! Oh, Maison Labs. This is a corporation that does not believe in what Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Because they can, they will. So they're kind of a hybrid faction that sports elements from the traditional GCPS military-style stuff, but also some insane cyborgs and plague experiments to add a bunch of extra flavor. Because nothing's ever gone wrong in a lab in a sci-fi universe, these shady corporate scientists do their best to tamper with nature and do some of the highest quality military stuff like the Urbana Cold Spear to keep them and their facilities safe. If being the center of weaponizing viruses and combining elements of multiple factions is your jam, this is the faction for you. Use your character. Ready? The 
The GCPS calls a conglomeration of ocean-loving tentacle squid species as nameless because their language is basically impossible for humans to pronounce. Wait, how am I supposed to pronounce this? Most of the nameless are, or at least were, peaceful until fairly recently. Now, the I told you it's hard to say, is a religious faction within the nameless that has decided that now is the time for conquest, so using the power of fanaticism and the truly awesome wide variety of tentacle creatures, the nameless are taking to the galaxy and quickly becoming a massive threat to the GCPS. If Cthulhu faced space squids, shrimps, crabs, and a whole lot more are your slimy jam, this is the faction for you. Use your character! The mutant pathogen that humanity just couldn't leave alone is possibly the greatest threat to the entire galaxy. Infected victims find their bodies mangled and twisted with bony protrusions shortly after mysterious artifacts are found on very far out worlds. The plague starts out with one big mamma that infects some guys, and then those guys infect some other guys, and then those guys infect other guys with varying degrees of mutation in between. Some become massive killing machines, while others maintain similar features and motor skills to when they were out and about living their normal lives. The plague kill things indiscriminately, and basically exists just to spread and cause problems. If massive monstrosities, zombies, birds, and more are your thing, then this is the faction for you. Use your character! With oppressive corporate greed and expansion comes a lot of disenfranchised races and motivations. Rebs is kind of the catch-all term for the various movements and rebellions across the status quo of the galaxy. However, it's not one giant movement with one common goal, with one common leader, so the Rebs are kind of a disorganized mess with lots of different motivations. Some are freedom fighters, and some are noble races fighting for their homes, while some are just trying to make a quick buck in all the chaos unfolding around the galaxy. Some groups of Rebs are melting pots of different cultures and races, but the one thing that they all have in common is their desire to take down the oppressors and fight back. So if you love a wide variety of goals, races, and playstyles, then Woo Go Rebs is the faction for you. Use your character. Giant space rats is something we don't have to worry about in our universe, but people in the Warpath universe do have to worry about it. Entire colonies of man-sized and sometimes even larger rats fester in the dark corners and undergrounds of all the planets around the entire GCPS. Well, keep your eyes peeled. They're everywhere. If you've ever had a mouse or rat problem in your pantry, this is like that, but a million times worse. These repulsive creatures infest everything and serve their broodmother in the worst ways possible with chemical throwing weapons and nasty looking engineering that just seems to get the job done. Veermen are responsible for containment protocols all across the galaxy on a regular basis. So if gribbly space rats with ray guns, space armor, and much more sounds like a filthy good time to you, this is the faction for you. Whew, so with all the factions explained, there isn't much to go over before you guys can feel free to hit the table and start killing some mods. Moving into Dead Zone 3rd Edition, there's been a big shift in the lore from fighting and containment protocols on forsaken outposts and mining worlds to more developed spheres of the GCPS. This means that wars and battles are making their way deeper and deeper towards the core of corporate space, which is a really cool direction to see the story going. Instead of just fringe worlds, now cyberpunk cities and technologically advanced places are finding themselves at the center of conflicts, which is awesome for the story and awesome for my terrain collection. So now that you know why everyone's fighting and what they're fighting over, it's time to jump into Hats Wait! Dead Zone is fast, fun, three-dimensional, and easy to learn, and the goal of this section of this video is to prove that to you by showing you exactly how this game works. First, you'll need some stuff. You'll need miniatures for your chosen faction, obviously, some eight-sided dice, some command dice, which I'll cover in just a bit, the rulebook, the force list book, and the terrain. If you don't have all this stuff from previous editions, that's what starter sets are for. So go get one and get started. Like most miniature war games, you'll need a tape measure. Psych! Just kidding, get that thing out of here. You don't need it for Dead Zone. That makes everything faster and easier. Okay, you get all your stuff? Great. Before we go to the table and start rolling dice, it's important to know what you're looking at when you look at the rulebook. But since you're watching this video, it kind of leads me to believe that you're lazy and you don't want to read it yourself. So that's what I'm here for. Let's look at stat profiles. This is what's going to be in the Force List book, and it'll have all the factions in one book. Thank goodness. Each model has a list of stats, keywords, weaponry, and points values that are all listed in this handy dandy stat sheet. This got reworked a little bit from previous editions to be the most streamlined and easy to understand version it could possibly be. At the top, we have the name of the model. Then we have the speed, how quickly the model can move around the board. 
broken up into two numbers, the first number being a short action and the second number being a long action. More on that in a second. Then RA, or ranged. This is how good the model is at shooting, throwing, whatever. Something that's a ranged attack. FI, or fight. This is how good the model is at punching, stabbing, kicking, or whatevering when up close and personal. SV, or survive. This is how good your model is at evading, tanking, or not getting killed. AR, or armor. How many layers of protection this model has, basically to soak up damage so your squishy innards aren't all over the floor. HP, or health points. This is how many hits you can take before your chalk outline. SZ, or size. How big the model is and how much space does it take up in a cube. Then we have our base size. Literally, what size does the base go on when you're building the actual model. Keywords. Another simple way of saying special rules, or something that applies to the model to make it more unique. I'm different, yeah, I'm different. So it's not just a big game of chess where every piece is the same. Weapons. What weapons the model's using, be it ranged or close combat. That's a knife. VPs or victory points. How much closer will the opponent be to winning if they kill it? Basic dudes are usually worth like one victory point, but more valuable models with better weaponry or better stats tend to cost more. Cost. How valuable is your model in relation to everything else in the game? This is for balanced games, so that armies are relatively the same value when you start. There are five categories for models as well. Number one, there are leaders. You get one of these and your chosen leader is the commander of your strike team. Number two, troops. These are your basic rank and file dudes. Number three, specialist. Models with have super fun, cool, shiny toys that blow stuff up and cut things up real good like. Number four, living legends. Another way of saying unique named characters. Some being mercenaries, some being infamous leaders or beasts from your chosen faction. And number five, support. These are the big old things that take troops to unlock because they're so big and full of heavy support. Think of stuff like striders and goliaths. Another quick stat that's worth pointing out is AP, or armor piercing. Basically, the number of your AP is how much armor you get to ignore when you're finding out how much damage you do to something. Dead Zone uses eight-sided dice. Ones are bad and eights are amazing, so all you have to do is just roll a bunch of eights and you can pretend that you're really good at this game. At least, that's what I do. You can also make sure that your opponent's really unlucky and rolls lots of low numbers like ones, and that'll make it look like you know what you're doing and that you're actually really good at this game. Again, I do that too. But for real, dice tests in Dead Zone are super easy to understand and they're really fun to do. The first type of test is an unopposed test, basically where you need to roll a certain amount of successes, all those stats that we talked about a minute ago, and basically if you get the number that's in parentheses, you succeed, and if you get less than that, you don't. This is usually for stuff like making sure that your grenade goes into the right cube that you want it to go in and stuff like that. The second type of test is the core of what Dead Zone's all about. This is the opposed test where you roll your dice, your opponent rolls their dice, and you compare your results against each other. Most dice start off at three dice per player, but that can be adjusted depending on the circumstance or position that you find yourself in. One of the best things about Dead Zone is that modifiers only add or subtract the amount of dice in a test, never the actual result that you need. If your stat says you need a 5 up, that number will never change. Only the amount of dice that you get to roll towards that goal. And remember when I said that 8s were really good? Well, that's because that's the heart of Dead Zone, and the heart of Dead Zone is the exploding 8s mechanic. Every time you roll an 8, you get another bonus dice that gets added to your test, and this goes on and on until you stop rolling 8s, so it can get absolutely nutty. This is madness! Madness. This is... Dead Zone. In the community, we call this an 8 train. This is awesome for so many reasons, and it means that no matter what, no matter how badly the odds are stacked against you for a test, it means you can always get super lucky and pull off the seemingly impossible. These are the super memorable cinematic moments that will burn into your brain every time you think about Dead Zone. Moments where your crappy wounded plague dog bites off the arm of a strider, or this is the time that you're staring down the barrel of a dominator rifle and a peacekeeper unloads and somehow you dodge every single shot. This is what Dead Zone is all about, and Exploding Apes are responsible for all the moments that make you say, That was totally Dead Zone is 3D, which means that the whole board isn't just 8x8. Rather, think of it as 8x8x8. I mean, you probably won't stack it 8 tall, but you know what I mean. Thinking about the game in three dimensions is really important and can lead to better chances for your dice when you're playing the actual game. Your position within a cube is really important, so having your model physically in advantageous areas or hugging cover could be the difference between life and death. Each cube has a capacity of how many models can fit inside. 
The collective size stat of your strike team's miniatures can't go over 4 at any time, so if you have a big messy combat or something like that, oh, it's all in one cube, each team has a total of 4 to work with. So you could have 4 size 1 models, or a size 1 and a size 3, or 2 size 2s, anyways, you get the point. Ranges are also determined by cubes, and so that eliminates any use for any sort of tape measure. Line of sight changed slightly in 3rd edition from what it was in 2nd edition. Basically, now what you want to do is picture a cylinder starting from the base of your miniature up to the top of his head, or his back if he's like arching over or something. If you can see that area, you can shoot the target. If you can see all of that area, you'll get a clear shot. When we cover this in shooting down the road, that's what I'll be talking about. So now, thanks to the new line of sight rules, you can't get shot out of just a tiny bit of your tail or a tiny bit of a tentacle or your barrel of your gun is sticking up by just a little bit, just past a wall. And on the flip side, you also can't be white out in the open, but just have the tip of your tail, a tiny bit of your tentacle, or the barrel of your gun sticking into a wall, preventing a clear shot. It's clean and elegant and stops all the weird gamey stuff that makes you want to scratch your head in confusion. And if you ask me, it's all for the better. Trust me on this, guys. Next up, let's talk about command dice before we get into all the actions that your models can do. Command dice are that certain X factor that can really change the game. Whether it's hardcore tactical training and cohesion of your strike team, or just sheer dumb luck in game form, command dice are a cool way to do extra actions and can really shape the game. Before you start a round, you roll your command dice. These are the six-sided dice with symbols, and the amount of dice that you roll is dependent on your leader and their tactician value. Number one. This symbol is the plus one model activation symbol. Since Dead Zone goes back and forth between opponents activating models, this action breaks that up, so it allows you to activate two models in a row before the other guy gets to go. This could be really, really good, and I really love this action. However, it can only be done once, so you can't keep playing these over and over and just activating everybody. Number two. This is the dice symbol. This one's very straightforward. You use this dice, or multiples of this dice, to add another dice to a shoot, assault, or survive test. Whether you really need something dead, or you really need something to stay alive. And a new sheen of consummate professionalism that really gives the dice a big boost. This command dice comes in handy when you need that extra little bump. Number three. This is possibly my favorite command dice, and this is the move command dice. This one allows a model to use a free move of one cube, which helps in almost every situation. Do you need to move up a cube so you can see a target so you can shoot it later? Move dice. Do you have a heavy weapon that takes penalties for moving and shooting? Move dice. Do you need to attack that model way over there? Move dice. Do you need to poke out of cover, shoot, and then go back to cover where, or back onto an objective? Move dice. Move dice are the best. This is a shoot dice, and it's very straightforward. Got a guy with a range attack, but you already shot something? Shoot again with the shoot dice. This can be done to either the same target or a different one. So it's really great and really flexible. Allows you to do literally double the amount of things you could normally do. Speaking of simple actions... Five. Are you fighting something but you wish you could fight it again? Assault dice! Straightforward and awesome. Number six. This is the special order or the mantic splat symbol. These are different for every single leader in the game, and depending on what your strike team leader is doing, it's super important. It can be a lot of different things, so it adds a lot of synergy and a lot of ways to build your army. And so this is kind of the crux of what makes a leader special. You make me feel special. And thus makes your strike team special. All right, so you've got all your stuff, you've rolled your command dice, and you're ready to play. Let's talk about actions and all the stuff you can do in Dead Zone. Each model that activates gets to do either two short actions or one long action. The list of actions are listed here. Advance. This is a short action where your model can move up to the amount of cubes that's listed in its first move stat. There's a bunch of details I'm going to skip over in this video, but the long and short of it, <laughs> see what I did there, is if you advance you have to have a clear route or a climbable wall or some sort of something like that that makes sense in order for you to go from point A to point B. Sprint. This is exactly like the advance action and follows all the same rules, but now your model can go as many cubes as listed as the second number in their stat profile. Shoot. I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. Shooting is a three dice opposed test where you roll against your opponent's survive roll, and there are three simple modifiers for shooting that'll increase or decrease your chances of doing damage. Number one is a clear shot. This will give you two extra dice if you have an unobstructed view to that cylinder of line of sight that we talked about just a few seconds ago. If you have high ground on a model, you'll get plus one dice to your shoot. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! And friendly fire. This is a minus two dice to the shooter if there's a friendly model in the target queue. 
Each difference in success is a point of damage. This can be soaked up by armor, or it can get ignored by AP. Lots of moving around in Dead Zone is based around getting these modifiers to work in your favor. So now let's talk about the other way to kill people, the assault action. Assault is a long action, but a free assault is triggered automatically any time a model moves into the same cube as an opponent model. So, just like shoot actions, this is an opposed dice test, and this time, the target model can choose to either fight back or survive. So, the modifiers for fighting are pretty straightforward. You get plus one dice if your model moved into the cube and triggered the fight, kind of like a charging bonus. You get plus one dice if one or more friendly models are in the same cube. You get plus one die if the opposing model is injured. good to kick them while they're down, you know? You get plus one die if the model is larger in size. I'm bigger than you, I'm higher in the food chain! And you can also get plus one if the opposing model was pinned when you started the assault action. If you choose to survive, modifiers are pretty similar. You get plus one if you have friends in a cube, you get plus one if your opponent is injured, and you get plus one if you are larger than the other model. Damage works the same way as shooting, and it's a bloody great time. The next section I want to touch on real quick is stand up. If your model is pinned by either getting thrown around or ducking from suppressive fire, stand up is the short action that you have to do before you do anything else. And finally, the last action is called a special action. This is a deliberately vague catch-all term for any of the other sort of actions you might be able to do, like hacking terminals and things like that. Usually this is for objective play. And there you have it, that's basically how to play Dead Zone. Obviously there's quite a few keywords and situations that aren't covered in this video, but this should be a fantastic taster to get you the main ideas, and hopefully will get you excited about this game. There are 16 different scenarios in the book, so try them all out. <laughs> no, that's a lot of scenarios. And they're all really fun. So far I've played quite a few of them and I love them all. So now that you have the basics down, there's only one thing to go do. Go play some Dead Zone, guys, seriously. Quick! Get out! Get out of here! This video was a ton of fun to make and a ton of effort, and I really truly hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed making it and putting it all together. Honestly, like, I mean, this video was seriously downloading so many different bits of media and audio, and I'm sitting in my closet right now trying to get the best audio quality, so hopefully the effort pays off, and I hope you guys really did enjoy this. With all that being said, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and keep rolling aids, guys. Stay tuned to this channel for more content, it's going to be great. I can't wait for 3rd edition, and I can't wait for you guys to really dive into it like I've been able to. Dead Zone. <laughs>